Yeah, <laughs> that's funny that, um, oh, we didn't even say that he, uh, people our age would know him from Awesome Powers. <laughs> Michael Caine? Yeah. I don't even remember Michael Caine and Austin Powers. He was in Goldmember. He was uh, um, Austin's dad. It's such a funny... Oh, yeah, I guess he was. (laughs) (laughs) No, what's really funny is Cabaret also has a Austin Powers reference because Basil Exposition is the main character of Cabaret. Oh, yeah. And Mike had like has never seen Austin Powers and I had no idea. And I was like, man, I was like, I knew this actor instantly because of Austin Powers. And that's all I knew him from. <laughs> that's hilarious. <laughs> so it was so funny. Like as soon as I saw him, I was like, that dude's an Austin Powers. <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> so back to back Austin Powers references. Yeah. Awesome. Welcome to VCR, a vintage cinema rewind. We're bringing old movies to new viewers. I'm Blake. I'm Jason. And we're talking a deep dive on a old but very much underrated film, the 1982 film Death Trap, starring Christopher Reeve and Sir Michael Caine. Michael Caine. Michael Caine. You I... have to talk slow. <laughs> Man, like Michael Caine. He is the best person to uh, do a... An, an impersonation? And, yeah, yeah. It's him or Morgan Freeman are the top two. Yeah. By yeah, far. Definitely. And if you have them both in the same movie together, then uh, it's movie magic right there. Has that ever happened? The Dark Knight? Oh, The Dark Knight, of course. <laughs> 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 Anyways, let's get into it. Yeah, for sure. Again, if you've never seen this movie, it's a mystery. That It's kind of a mystery black comedy. It's based on a theatrical play that ran on Broadway. If even you've never seen it and you're kind of interested in a film like Knives Out... Please go listen to our other episode and don't listen to the spoiler episode right off the bat here because I don't want to ruin this movie for you. It's a really fun watch and worth your time. Very much so. It's uh, one of the best, like, hooks. It hooked me so suddenly. Like, I was was just a fish in a stream and then it yanked me out. (laughs) (laughs) I love it. I love it. Do we want to start with that then? Do we want to start with the hook? Like what uh, what got you, what you drew you into this film? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. So basically, I started watching this with my partner, Annabelle, and she didn't like the intro. Like she skipped the intro song, like the music at the very beginning, and she's like, oh, this is so annoying. And then yeah. for the first like 15 minutes, she was really annoyed with um, uh, Myra, his... Uh, Michael Caine's yeah, wife's Myra, character. Wife? Yeah, because she, she just kept saying, like, darling, like, over the top. So she dipped out within 15 minutes. And then I settled in and uh, kept watching. And, like, it's it builds up a little bit. The contemplation of whether or not Sidney Brule, the struggling playwright, will actually, like, he wants to kill this kid to take his manuscript. So, like, it was kind of slow bringing it in. And it feels like he is going to do it. Like, it feels like right off the bat, like, it feels like he is serious. Like, he has seen his own mortality, and he wants to live through it forever. Yeah. And and this is a way to achieve immortality is by killing this young man. And Myra is just such a loving wife that she's like, oh, yeah, like, whatever. Like, you know, you do you kind of thing. And she's just like, you know, just very supportive of him. Like, can't even see that he might have had a failed play. And then she almost doesn't believe him that he's he's considering he's, this and yeah, contemplating this. Yeah, it's a little too over the top, even though she married this murder mystery, um, like, fanatic. When uh, this the manuscript, when he's looking at it, Myra's like, is it really that good? And he's like, I'll tell you how good it is. Even a gifted director couldn't hurt it, which is... I had a good laugh yeah, at that. Yeah, like, that was really good. And then, um, so, he eventually does kill him, and I was like, oh, fuck, that was a really, like, brutal murder, because, uh, mm-hmm. like, it was well, quite intense. And let's talk about the tension, the build-up to that point in oh, time, yeah. too. Like, And this is what I'm talking about. Throughout this film, it's just build and build and build, mm-hmm. and then release. Something big happens, and then we go back to like the aftermath of that. And then we build, and we build, and we build, and it starts off slow, and it just builds up and builds up, and then we get a release. Like That happens four or five times throughout the film, and it's 
it's so masterfully how that how well that's done because if you we think back to when we did like jaws for example Mm -hmm. and steven spielberg said about jaws is that with the audience you really only get one jump scare like one pure scare and then the audience is on their toes at this point yeah however with this film it's not necessarily scare but it's the way that it builds tension every time it builds tension i'm on the edge of my seat by the end of that yeah yeah. and 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 every time i'm just waiting for the the eventual explosion or implosion to happen and it's pretty significant it's pretty amazing that Sidney lumet and the actors were able to kind of build that tension and every time me to be drawn back into it again. Yeah. And that, so right after uh, he kills him and he's already buried the body and they're going back to bed, I was like expecting a, another slower build up. And right. they they begin that process, but then they suddenly hook you again. And that right. like so the tension wasn't fully built there, but it was like, oh, this is like the pattern of this movie is we're gonna build up a little bit again. And then it just gets you again. So it almost hits you like twice within like five minutes. So right. that's that's where I really got hooked was he's taking the body out and buried it. And then him and Myra are going back to bed and they like have a few like funny little quips like uh, I wonder if murder is an aphrodisiac and then they're like getting back right. into bed and then he's yeah, like Yeah, because it takes a while for Sydney to convince her that this was the right decision. Yeah. Because and leading up to the kill, and this is what also kind of builds attention really well, is because we as the audience know that Sydney is contemplating murder and Myra knows this as well. Mm. And Myra's having cold feet about the the idea and and she's realizing that her husband is serious yeah she tries to convince him not to while clifford is sitting in the chair with the handcuffs on and that handcuff scene was great yes and again like it's just the tension there of like you know the the handcuffs aren't working and clifford is is starting to contemplate like yeah yeah when you see that dawning on his face that was like a great um like great acting and yes. just such a great like plot dynamic. Right. Yeah, exactly. Because everybody in this room knows where things are heading, but nobody's saying it out loud and nobody's directly like speaking of it. And then again, it builds that tension right th- in that moment even. And then, you know, the, they talk about the phone number and then he unlocks the him with the handcuffs. He's got the key and they all kind of laugh like, oh, like, you know, I was starting to think you were maybe going to kill me. But yeah. like, you know, like... <laughs> Yeah, and because they we we know that both of them are such skillful mystery writers mm-hmm. that they they're always thinking about it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And then yeah, when um eventually Sydney asks Myra to open the door or open the window in their bedroom, mm-hmm. and this this set is just phenomenal. I love the building because like the. In their bedroom, they live in a old house with a windmill, and the windmill moves. Yeah, it's kind of like a cottage-style house with a windmill attached to it, and their bedroom is in the top of the windmill. Yeah, and then the study with all of the weapons is right below that. Right. And um, so anyways, he, she opens the window. And he asks her, small note here, he asks her to open the window. Yeah, he asked her twice yes. at different times yes. leading up to that. And that's that's where you're already thinking as the audience, like, like, oh, is he going to come through the window or not? Right. And um, then I didn't he think does. he was coming through the window. I didn't see that happening. But afterwards, on reflection, I was like, he kept bringing up the window there. Yeah, yeah. I noticed the window because I was like watching him for it. I was like, he, like he, the guy's not dead. And I like have that in my notes. Uh, so he comes back through the window and I was just expecting a regular like, oh, he's not dead. He's going to come back and kill us. Right. And then uh, that happens. And so he comes through the window, beats up Sydney and then chases Myra downstairs. Myra's running all over the place. And the seeds of this is being laid out through the earlier part in the movie where uh, Myra has is like somewhat sickly. She has uh, anxiety and she's mm-hmm. on medication. She can't mix alcohol with her medication either. Right. And so he's scared. He's chasing her around. She has a heart attack. Yes. And then as soon as she has a heart attack, 
Clifford like checks if she's breathing mm-hmm. still with the mirror in front of her nose. That's like an old school right. way to check if someone's dead. And then suddenly Sydney walks up from the like shadows behind happened. him. And and I loved that camera shot of him yeah. standing there over the body and Sydney comes because at first when I see this moment, I'm like, oh my god, Sydney's gonna like come in here and get him, right? Yeah, yeah. And then it changes. And this is the first big twist of the entire movie yeah is that they're in on it that's the moment that i stood up and i was like what no yeah exactly <laughs> the same moment for me like from then on you've got me this whole movie i'm yeah. in i'm fully invested yeah. in what's happening because the fact that sydney and clifford came up with this elaborate plan to kill myra it's so elaborate yeah oh like so impossibly elaborate and only a mystery writer could write that yeah and then exactly and to bring up, like, the pills over and over again to her, to almost, yeah. like, and again, like you said, the alcohol, and you not be able to mix that, and, like, him, like, strategically having them drink, and, you know, building up her anxiety and yeah. everything, and and making her go to the window, or asking her to go to the window. And, like, the way he, like, forces her down the stairs to check on that sound that she heard outside. Right. And, like, brings her back down. So she's, like, elevated, and then brought back down to calm, and then elevated, and then brought back to calm. Mm-hmm. It's so immaculate. Yeah, exactly. And then uh, how how quick did you, after you realized they were working together, think that they were also together? Like, pretty lovers? Honestly, pretty quickly. I, I kind of yeah. felt that there was some yeah. chemistry there. And that's something that's really cool about the performances between them is I genuinely believed that those two were romantically involved pretty quickly. Same here. And I think that other actors especially back in 1982, would not have been able to convincingly portray that on screen. And this is what's really interesting about this film. And I'm going to I'm gonna jump a little bit ahead to a discussion of, of the look back of the times, is that that kissing scene wasn't actually in the original Broadway play. There were yeah, some, yeah. there were some hints that maybe there was a relationship between Sidney and Clifford. But it wasn't outwardly said, whereas in the theatrical version, they decided to add that in there, that kiss in there. What's really interesting about that is because in 2023, that kiss is perfect. I absolutely love the the placement of it in the film. It, mm. it completely sells their relationship. It completely sells everything that's gone up on until this point in time. It even like makes the paranoia and the tension in the latter half of the film just all that more all that more impactful i guess i almost i want to connect this to another recent pop culture phenomenon which was episode three i think of the last of us Mm. you've seen it no i haven't seen it but i know what episode you're talking about okay yeah so uh because again like in the original game of the last of us it's implied that there's a gay relationship but then in the in the show like now that we're in 2023 and things are like i don't know it was much more well received Mm -hmm. that and like we were able to show like this amazing love scene between two men in uh in the show like that hit people right in the feels so like this this is doing that um in 1982 basically yeah and and what's really interesting about that is audiences were very mixed and and to be honest Mm -hmm. did not appreciate the kiss back then and that's why this film maybe somewhat underperformed what it could have done yeah i saw a uh a quote i think it was from christopher reeve in in like the early screenings people found out that uh there was this kiss Mm -hmm. and then that news kind of was spread like word of mouth that um christopher reeves and michael kane kiss and so in like more like after that got out people would go to the theater and um as soon as that kiss happened there's like somebody would scream like no superman don't do it or something right, like and that boo like, and something... stuff like that yeah yeah so uh christopher reeve thinks that about 10 million dollars worth of like show revenue was lost because of the kiss right because like as soon as everyone knows it's like the sixth sense if you know like Bruce Willis is dead the whole time. Spoilers, sorry. But um <laughs> then then uh like you've heard that line over and over, then you might not watch it. Right. So the same thing happened for this movie back then. Yeah. 
Yeah, I very much agree. Like, and it's so interesting to see how a film that's maybe ahead of its time just fades into obscurity because at that time audiences weren't ready for that. Yeah. And and now like like I said, it, this movie hooked me and and that kiss, I think without that it makes the whole film less effective. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh we forgot a little um Helga Tendorp. Yes. Like she came in also and added that extra stress before we find out that Clifford wasn't dead. Right. And this happens not long after the murder and before Clifford is resurrected, we'll say. Yeah. Yeah. So Helga walks around the set or like their house mm-hmm. and uh is like pain here, like you have pain to Myra. Right. And and she touches she touches Sydney's hand and the look of yeah. shock on her face. Like it's it's like she senses the ill intent that he has, but she doesn't quite at this point know what he's planning yeah yeah like she knows just enough to add all this extra suspense to the audience Mm -hmm. and not enough to ruin it exactly and you're thinking he's gonna have to kill her the whole time yeah anytime she shows up she's you're like she has to die (laughs) yes and what's really great about that again is later on in the film sydney's on to her as well he's you know, if if this is another person like Clifford, Clifford kind of shrugs her off a little bit and yeah. underestimates her. But Sydney, because Sydney's been writing these murder mystery plays for so long, I think he lends some credibility to her psychic powers and the fact that like something even as hokey as this could maybe get him caught. And he's a pretty yeah. cautious, careful guy. Yeah, but he's also kind of excited by it. Yeah. Well, like, yeah. Like, He's cautious, but he also loves the excitement of, like, acting out a real mystery in his life. Like, his, like mm-hmm. he's, like, finally living his stories. Yes. And that's, like, subtle. Yes. And you know what this actually reminded me of is a short story by Joe Hill that it's about a guy, an editor for, like, a horror magazine. And he's come to not love his job anymore. And what he does is he ends up going to some house where somebody said that they've written this like best new horror uh that's actually what the short story is called best new horror and so he goes to their house and their house is like a house of a thousand corpses devil's reject kind of family and Mm. basically they're out to murder him and the the short story ends with him running from the house and being chased by the family who are trying to kill him and him being excited about it for the first time in a long time that's so Stephen King. Yeah. Oh, it's Joe Hill. It's his brother or his son. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah that's what I'm. Yeah. I I always mix that up with his other pen name. Oh yeah, Richard Bachman. Yeah. Yeah. Another note to go like another tangent where this is related is uh, American Psycho. Yes. Christopher Reeve's performance could be said. There are some connections potentially to Christian Bale's Ooh, portrayal. I like this. I like where you're heading with this because this is similar to my thought too. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, it, it's not super direct because we've seen, like, we've also heard that Christian Bale was um, replicating uh, uh, Tom, Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. Yeah. And and you know who I? So this is going back to what I said in the spoiler free discussion. Is Christopher Reeve reminded me of someone, and it took me like middle of the night while I'm sitting there lying there thinking about this movie to realize that I thought that Christopher Reeves reminded me of Tom Cruise, the actor. No way. And his performance. And it's so crazy that you're bringing up American Psycho and, and how Christian Bale's performance is based on Tom Cruise, because that is exactly who I thought Christopher Reeve was emulating there before Tom Cruise was Tom Cruise. Yeah, exactly. And all of these movies are really interconnected because, uh, like, American Psycho, he's envisioning all of these murders, and or he's actually doing them. We don't, Depends on how you look at it. Right, yep. It's the same concept that's going on. And, yeah, just how amazing was it that they tricked us completely in thinking that um, the whole point was to murder the kid, and then, the whole, like, right. then it, they flip it on you. That was all the setup to have his wife had have a heart attack and this is where it becomes so meta as well because right then it becomes that. this play within a play and and it's two masters well it's one master screenwriter and his student 
and their banter between how a how a murder play is supposed to happen and even and even this is more alluded to in the first part as well when sydney's coming up with the plot to have him murdered Mm -hmm. and how how a great screenwriter would orchestrate this think about it yeah and this this is exactly like in uh dial m for murder as well because uh like Mm -hmm. they're trying to plot this perfect murder this is up there with like the greatest mystery movies like it has yeah. to be mentioned next to Dial M for Murder, I think. And I loved it. I love this movie, and it's a little bit of a spoiler to our review, but I really, really love this movie. Yeah, and then um, we keep going past this big like twist, and we find out that um, so they were working together, they were in love, whatever, and now they're trying to write some new stuff they're working together they're kind of laying Mm -hmm. low while the money from the uh, uh, life insurance comes in and he can eventually sell the house and get this money they haven't discussed how much money they're getting like he's getting from myra then the lawyer comes in and sees that clifford is hiding some notes in Mm -hmm. a locked drawer and that gets sydney like on edge and what's really interesting about this as well is the evolution of clifford throughout this film and christopher reeve's performance is really interesting because and this is what christopher reeve said about clifford anderson is that there's a certain kind of g whiz quality about him yes when when you meet him I really loved that in this film where she's just yeah. like, oh, yeah, Such an like innocent, naive kid in the in like when you're introduced to him, you're like, oh, he's just so excited to be here. Like he yeah, he wants to like split his notes with Sydney and um, have Myra read another copy. And like, yeah, he's just so happy go lucky. Yeah. Amazing. And, and acting. it's all it's all an act. Yeah. Yeah. And, an act within an act. Yeah. And, and what's really interesting is until the lawyer notices that Christopher Reeve is maybe hiding something, I still almost consider him to be that gee whiz kid. Yeah. Like, even though he's just helped uh, Sydney commit murder, I still don't recognize him as the threat that he is yet. Exactly. And then that's like the, what is, are we on the third reveal, basically? Like yeah. Like the third big thing. Um this is like yeah the twist that clifford is a literal sociopath right and actually what's really funny is in the opening 30 minutes of this film this contrast that i I wrote down that i noticed that you know how loving of a wife uh myra is and sydney is borderline a sociopath and i wrote that down i wrote the literal word down sociopath yeah question mark and and it's so interesting that it gets brought up later on yeah uh, and dissected yeah part of also the reason why annabelle was kind of done with the movie was how mean and like how degrading um sydney was to his wife in the beginning like you could see that like it was like she was uh that like light and fluffy character and he's this like really mean character who's like controlling her and everything but then i loved it before she died, she was like, you know, I was really worried that I was actually happy that you did commit the murder. Like she was right. in on it by the end. And then they, yeah. and then they kill her. It's because she's always supportive of him. And, and yeah. she, there's, there's almost a point in time where she pulls away from him, but he's just, there's something about him that just pulls her back in. Yeah. Again. Yeah. So many levels. Oh God. There's so many levels to this movie. And so, like I said with the camera shots, uh, which is somewhat what I wanted to discuss here, and and the specific, when I really noticed it, was after that when Clifford and Sydney are having that back and forth about Clifford's criminal background and his sociopathic tendencies. And those camera shots to start are very long camera shots. Mm-hmm. And then as time goes on in the scene, they get quicker and quicker. And then we get closer and closer on their faces as well. And and by the end of that, like you're literally on the edge of your seat. Like who's going to explode first? And this is actually where when when Sydney finds out that Clifford is going behind his back and writing Death Trap, the story of the murder. Yeah. This is maybe one of my favorite scenes of Michael Caine ever in a film. His when he out. gets angry yes. at Clifford. Yes. It is incredible. I I don't think I breathed for the like two or three minutes that he's screaming at Clifford. Yeah. So he he does like he screams at Clifford and then at a certain point Clifford is like 
like he freaks out and he's like put right. it down and like that sudden change in demeanor is the, where you see like the mask come off of right. Clifford as well and mm-hmm. and then and the you, first time you're really scared of him yeah and that's where you see uh Sydney like oh shit I've underestimated him as well right oh it was so good yeah, it, it was so good. So good. I wrote four pages of notes on this. For some movies, I only write like one page or two like mm-hmm. back and front, but I wrote like four pages just and like one full page was after I'd finished the movie. And yeah. Right. Like that's awesome. I'm trying to like <laughs> bring everything up, but his freak out was just so perfect. I wrote that down. Right. Yeah. Right. I wanna talk callbacks and foreshadowing a little bit. Mm. Unless you they're like unless there's some like big other scenes but like there's there's a couple things that have have kind of cropped up throughout this now that we've kind of discussed a couple things but i wanted to see if like there were anything that you thought of while you were watching or after you watched that just kind of got in your mind and was like oh that's a little bit of spicy storytelling in here yeah um or use of props because we've already talked about like the meds and we've talked about myra being asked to go to the window was there anything else for you that jumped out at you when it came to helga tendorp she was calling out like a bunch of things but Mm -hmm. she created a Chekhov's gun out of the dagger we had already seen Clifford and Sydney talk about the dagger but then she comes in and is like women have used this but uh one more women will use this to stab you in the back Hmm. did that actually happen I don't think the dagger killed like the dagger didn't get used in the final scenes uh, didn't Clifford stab Michael Caine with that? Sydney with that? I don't... At the end? I don't think he did. I thought he... Oh, no, he, she had the gun. He had the gun, but, um, he dropped the gun, and then Helga drops gun at a certain point. The, the dagger was in play, but I don't think it was mm-hmm. used. And when we see the transition from the final, like, lightning murder scene to the play at the very end... Right. It looked like the Clifford took the crossbow bolt out of his back or chest or something oh, and stabbed yeah, yeah, yeah. Sydney with back. it. Yes. So that's where I don't think. So that's where I think a fake Chekhov's gun was placed mm. by Helga. And what about the real gun? That uh, did you notice the gun behind Clifford and how the light was just accenting it in such a way? I didn't. That I was. So when he was backing up, I was like, that gun is lit up very interestingly Interesting. behind him. Interesting, huh? And, and so that one is one that I definitely picked up on. Houdini's cuffs. Yes. Wow. That was, that was amazing. <laughs> so how, like, how smart of Sydney to say that these are Houdini's cuffs, not give him Houdini's cuffs, and then use, like, and then, of course... Clifford um, takes the real Houdini's cuffs yeah. from there, thinking cuffs that Sydney the, can get over the other cuffs. Yeah, cuffs him to the chair. And I loved how he said, like... Because he's such a sociopath, he's, like, talking and talking, and then he's, like, through the chair. He just added that into a sentence that it wasn't clear. And then he's like, no, right. you idiot. Put the uh, the cuffs through the chair. Like, the, the, those little elements of comedy just interspersed throughout everything mm-hmm. while all of this intensity is going on was just, like, tickled my brain in a certain way. Exactly. Same here. Uh, the other thing that I really appreciated was... The trick of going through or around the house, like using yeah. the full set yeah. as as like a, a as a trick to to trick somebody else, kind of thing. Yeah. And he uses it against Clifford twice in mm-hmm. the film, in the second part. Yes, I really yes, appreciate exactly. that. Yeah, yeah. So like using the set, this is one of the best like uses of the set as a character, kind of, um, or like as an essential proponent to the the plot, really. I want to put this in one of the top movie, like a top list of movies taking place in one location, just mm-hmm. like Hateful Eight and uh, f- like we talked about this a while ago, the Ten Thousand Year Old Man. Such a great like one set shot. Yeah, I actually I wish we had brought that up in the uh, when to watch or 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 who's this movie for because yeah. you really draw an interesting comparison to something like the hateful eight like it and and the, the way that it builds tension within a set number of characters in one location yes it's very similar and i don't know if you're tracking this uh like they they discuss 
so many elements of um like film writing or playwriting throughout their like interactions with Sydney and Clifford. Uh one of them is that um like the play that was written was a five character everyone's two dimensional and uh like they mentioned that and this whole movie only has five characters. Right. Like five main yeah. characters and like anybody else is like barely named. Right. Yeah, yeah. There's like a little bit at the beginning, a little bit at the end to kind of tie in the and, movie. And the way they talk about the audience, like this is what the audience will see. Like when um, right. when Clifford is going into his exposition about why they should write Death Trap. And man, Clifford is such a sociopath and the way he's explaining it, I'm almost convinced that they can get away with it. Yeah, yeah. Like, like we see this kind of thing in like pop culture now and like like how many people have gotten away with the craziest stuff just because they are rich or because they can yeah, yeah it's it's so timely <laughs> and apparently timeless timeless yeah timeless is a good word for that for sure what do you what do you think about the ending and myra being credited with the yeah. death trap play at the end yeah like it makes sense that they actually did kill each other and she found the the manuscript and was like well this is just perfect because she was already going to write her own book but right. um this just fell in her lap i thought like i thought it was a good ending it all it, it didn't let me down but it, it ended it with no like no strings attached kind of like it right. felt it, it, it felt like a natural ending that wasn't big this is like the Sydney Lumet ending. Like this is like a quintessential Sydney Lumet ending that just makes you feel very satisfied mm. at the end. Like I and and he just there's something about the way he does things with me is I often with his films end up sitting back at the back of my couch and kind of chuckling to myself and like and, and just really appreciating how how he can tie a movie in and and kind of conclude everything. Yeah. The way he does, I really always appreciate it. It almost felt like Inglorious Bastards as well, like the mm. like because it's not what you're expecting, and it it, it kind of like it wasn't shocking, but it was. I don't know, like I I just kind of liked how like it's different than Inglorious Bastards ending with like just murdering all the um, Hitler and his elite, but like it wasn't as big as that. But yeah, it just kind of right. like finished it. What other plot points do you want to discuss? Oh, I loved going back to like when Sydney figures out that Clifford is a sociopath there. He's like, so why do you like, why keep me? Like what, why do you need me? And, um, Clifford's like, uh, like you have to make sure that I always need you or I will kill you. And right. like that was such a sociopathic, psychopathic thing that was just like so perfect. I think like the writing there was just amazing to think that like that's how that's why um Clifford still needs Sydney and as soon as Sydney is no longer of use, he's gonna get rid of him. So he has to make sure that he's always needed by him. That that was such a like self-aware thing of a sociopath it's it's so conniving of him to like have sydney basically through sydney's schemes to help him write the final act of death trap yes yes and like as soon as sydney was like oh i'll write the second act don't you worry and then you're automatically thinking like oh how's he gonna write this so that he kills um Clifford, but then Clifford mm-hmm. like encouraged it's him one step ahead. Yes, one step ahead again, and like it, it draws you in one more time. And, like that was amazing because I I didn't know like at this point anything could be happening. Like mm-hmm. anybody could have been ahead of anybody, and they like balanced it so that it was just shocking enough and not over the top ridiculous. Yeah, I very much agree. Okay, should we move on from our uh, discussion of of the plot and and move into some of the other pieces of our discussion? 
Yeah, yeah, I think so. We've been going pretty ham with this discussion. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to talk sequels, prequels, or reboots really quickly. So this is, like we said, it's based on an original Broadway play called Death Trap by Ira Levin. Which was kind of an influenced by Mousetrap, which was yes. a much older, I think, 1920s, like longest running uh, play as well by someone huge, I forget. And uh, if you've never heard Ira Levin's name as well before, did you look up Ira's filmography? No, I did or not. His, or his novels? No. Okay. All right. So he wrote Rosemary's Baby and the Stepford Wives. Yes, yes, yes. And there was one other that I recognize as well. The other ones that he was notable for were Kiss Before Dying, The Perfect Day, and The Boys from Brazil. Oh, I think it was Boys from Brazil, but I haven't actually seen that. I've only heard mm. it referenced. Anyways, yeah. Like, those are some incredibly important horror films yeah. of of the 60s and 70s. Like, some of the most in- influential horror films of all time that he wrote. And so, it's really cool that, that this film kind of shares that connection. Yeah, and again, uh, sorry, Agatha Christie was the mousetrap trap. So that mm, was yes. like partially inspiration for this. And then he also made those other amazing works. That's crazy. Yeah, really cool. He actually was nominated for four Tonys for this film, um, even though it didn't win any. But it actually holds the record uh, still to this day for the longest running comedy thriller on Broadway. Wow. Yeah, it's well deserved. I very much agree. The other kind of connection here is actually to an older Michael Caine film yes. called Sleuth, yeah. which when this movie came out was very much noted for its kind of connections with the plot, the fact that Michael Caine also starred in that film, and just how how similar the two plots kind of play out. I've never actually seen Sleuth before. I never heard of it prior to this, and I think that's partially because it's, it's maybe an, another old film that's maybe fallen into obscurity. It does have a higher rating on IMDb than this, so I'm, I'm pretty interested in checking that one out after watching this one. Yeah, and they also remade it with uh, Michael Caine in, I yes. think, what was it, 97? Or no. Uh, I don't remember. They remade it, and it didn't do well. So no. I'd be interested in seeing the original. Yes, same. Uh, so effects and filming, I don't have too many notes on this. Kind of already talked about the play aspect. A couple notes, though, from this. The opening and the beginning shots where they're filming the play uh, was actually the real set stage of the Death Trap play yeah. that they used there, which is really cool. Yeah, and like 600 um, like costumed extras or something. Like They were yeah. people who were either watching the original play or they were... What was it? I, th- I think they were all actors in it or something. I, I forget. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it- it's really neat that they utilized the scenes from yeah. that. So it was a pl- yeah, I think was it Sidney Lumet said um, it was like a play within a play within a play within a play. Right. Exactly. Yeah. The other thing that Sidney Lumet said about about filming this, which I find is really interesting, is he said a melodrama like Death Trap requires a different set of movie muscles. You shoot, write, act and edit for story. The object is to have fun, and if you take yourself seriously, you're dead. The line between good mystery and good comedy is very thin, a knife edge. Both take delicate timing, and when an audience is really scared, their natural reaction is to laugh. And that's why, partially why this film works so well, is because the comedy is really perfectly timed in with the building of tension and the, mm-hmm. the release of tension. And even putting you in like a, a, a false sense of security sometimes throughout it as well. Yeah, that connection to comedy and horror where it is like changing your ex- – like going against your expectations and whatnot is so mm-hmm. interesting and, yeah, well-balanced here. Yeah, exactly. That's all I had for effects and filming. It was it, – like there's not a lot about this film just because, again, it, it was kind of mixed reception. And so there's not a lot documented necessarily about the making of this film. It was interesting a little uh, like note that – Clifford mentions to Sydney, like, who else but a mystery writer would have known to get... What's the thing that he chokes, like, that he kills Clifford with in the first place? Oh, 
I don't. I don't it's know. What like it's like a called. chain. It was. It was just a chain, yeah. I think. But so he chokes him with a chain, and he's like, "No one else but a mystery writer as good as you would have thought to get a chain with like fake blood pumps exactly. in it." Like that was that was a cool little detail that they discussed. They discussed everything that they did. Uh, it was so interesting. Yeah, it, and that's that's part of the the rewardingness about this film is because. It kind of peels back the layers of the writing of the film itself because because it's so meta and they're discussing like the the murder and and the act of murder and the act of acting out all of these. I think as as movie buffs and as if if you're interested in like the art of film, the art of of screenwriting, mm. this is really interesting. And even like the art of writing in general, this becomes a yeah. really interesting watch. Yeah, very much so. It reveals a lot and then keeps hitting you over the head. <laughs> yeah. I want to talk score really quickly. I thought, okay, and this is my critique of the film, is I thought the score was really weak. I didn't always find it quite matched up with what was happening. And at times it felt somewhat hokey. It, it just wasn't doing it for me. That that's a, This is my only small critique of the film Yeah, is, is that. I could agree with that. It it didn't reach out to me like in any way. Uh, I like right. almost barely noticed it because I was so focused on like what was going on, and I was just my mind was going so fast. That and that's completely fair. Um, I actually didn't look up who created the score for this, but it was Johnny Mandel, uh, who was known for composing for. Is that the show or the film Mash? That is the film Mash. That's oh. kind of neat. Hmm. And a few other notable films that he scored were Glenn Gary Ross and The Sandpiper. So not like a, a massive composer by any means, but but yeah, I thought, in my opinion, that's just my, my very, very small critique of this film is I, I could have used a better score. So a look back at the times, I already talked about a little bit of this and, and how controversial the kissing scene was. Mm -hmm. But the poster itself is very unique in that it features all of the characters together inside of a Rubik's Cube, or the three main characters yeah. of this. And there's two reasons for that. Not only does it represent a Rubik's Cube, but it also represents a or what's known as a puzzle box. The reason why it actually, they ended up kind of formatting it to look like a Rubik's Cube is because 1982 is actually the height of Rubik's Cube popularity. So they were trying to capitalize that as well on the poster, which is kind of... I was going to say that, yeah. Um, there's like there was a few notes about the Rubik's Cube's like part that uh, came up in my research as well. Because mm -hmm. it was only created in 74. Yeah. Eight years earlier, but uh, of course like it takes a while for things to get popular. So that's super interesting. It was connected in that way. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the legacy of this film, there's no way in my mind the film does not directly inspire Knives Out. Like, you can feel the inspiration for a film like Knives Out and something like this, mm -hmm. even though it's a difference of perspective of this film. I still really appreciated the uniqueness of this film and showing the perspective of the killer. And funny enough that you mentioned how Annabelle was upset with Diane Cannon's portrayal of the character mm. she actually was nominated for a golden raspberry in 1983 for worst supporting actress performance for yeah this one. i saw that as well and i was like well annabelle will be vindicated with this <laughs> yeah uh and she actually lost to eileen quinn for annie which huh. is a pretty big movie yeah, <laughs> it's funny hilarious. that that was nominated for razzie yeah the uh the house that film takes place in this house is actually a real house. That's it's a mansion on Long Island. Did you see who currently owns the house now? You know what? I had actually watched a walkthrough of his home, this house, like probably a year or two ago, just on Reddit, and uh, I was like, "Man, that's so Robert Downey Jr." <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Which that brought it back around for me. I was like, no way. Like I just watched this random movie. I knew nothing about. I saw it was Michael Caine and it like fit our mystery thing. And you saw it's Sidney Lumet and we're like, we have to watch this one. And then, yeah, like I had already watched like a walkthrough with RDJ in this house. 
Yeah, so Robert Downey Jr. actually bought this house, I believe, in 2017, which is amazing. And I guess my question to you then, seeing this in a modern day, like, did he did he change the aesthetic? Like, is it very much updated? Is it still like a very open concept? Like, what it, what did it look like? I think was it the was, fireplace still there? I I didn't like I I didn't think to know that from like the year or two ago that I watched it, but it was very much similar. And but like he made it more like cozy and like bright obviously mm. than dark and uh, mysterious he should have definitely put kept all the murder weapons uh on yeah. the wall though yeah i wonder <laughs> if they were there in the first place i have no idea <laughs> yeah the old owner just kept all that stuff there yeah. after the movie was done that would have been cool well they only shot the outside of the house in the film the inside was a set obviously so personal reviews of the partner factor we've kind of touched on like a lot of our reviews at this point i don't think there's going to be any surprises i don't know if you want to start or if you want me to basically yeah annabelle wasn't into it um and which is a shame that she just quite didn't get to the the point that draws you in i know and i had no idea that there was a point that drew us it like i was just waiting for it and um yeah she just missed it i think and like as soon as she heard me freaking out at the um like that pivotal scene i like explained everything i was like you're not gonna watch this but like this is like all the crazy th- shit that just happened i was like jumping all over the place connecting right. dots and um like i was just so excited and she's like shit i should have watched it <laughs> yeah so obviously that ties into my my review it's a top 10 in like so many categories top 10 mystery top 10 like mm-hmm. one set location Mm-hmm. like limited cast amazing like i, I top thoroughly, 10 michael kane performance it might be up there i i have to watch more of his old stuff to compare i think yeah that's fair but like like we've seen he overacted at some points i think is the only thing that um you which could is say. like a theatrical kind of expectation right you have exactly. to overact in a theatrical play to, yeah. to sell everything yeah. to the entire audience but i loved the intensity and i loved the and like he had some subtleness in there too at different points especially when he's contemplating things and like just yes in the first bit yeah and like the way he walks up out of the shadows and like mm-hmm. like his face completely changed from what you would expect and yeah i think the writing and directing was absolutely perfect if I were a critic, it'd be hard to give it a 10 out of 10. But since I'm not, I would give it a 10 out of 10. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so I guess segueing into my review in that sense then, Jess I both really like this one a lot. I think I was higher on it than her. And again, it's the the pacing thing of the, the first 20, 30 minutes that even though I, I wasn't hooked yet and I wasn't I wasn't sure if I was even going to like the full film. And, and funny enough, like at the 30 minute mark, I thought to myself like, okay, well, we know where this is going. We know he's going to kill him, mm. or he has killed him. How the hell does this film have an hour and a half left? Yeah, that, that like, drop where you're, you kind of plan out what you think is coming, and, like, you have an idea of what the movie's about, and, like, it's blurry. You had to completely scrap that at some point, at that yeah. one point where you're like, I'm at the edge of a cliff now. I don't know what's going to happen. Yes, I I very much agree, and and so that just completely like refreshes the movie for you, and refreshes your expectations, resets like where where things are going in your mind at that point, like you said. And so like other than the score, like this is this is a pretty damn near perfect movie for me too. Like I I really really had a lot of fun watching it. Michael Caine's performance is like a top tier performance for me. So is Christopher Reeve. Like I mm. want to watch more Christopher Reeve films now because the depth to his performance is yeah. is kind of incredible. It was extremely shocking, like knowing that he's Superman, that he had yeah. all of this, like as well. Yeah, exactly. And so I I I really appreciate the fact that he decided to do this to to kind of get out of that typecasting and really show off his acting chops because I fully think that he did have that that depth to his performance. Mm-hmm. And it's a movie that because of the mystery element in a sense sometimes mystery movies aren't something you always want to return to or maybe just you know you give it five ten years kind of thing before yeah. you come back to this one but i do almost kind of want to go back to this one in a, a little bit more recent like a little bit more sooner than that because 
I think that there's things that I miss that I'm going to pick up on another watch, and I'm excited about that. Yeah. And that's a good spot to leave me with a mystery film. Yeah, I agree. This is one of those movies that I would love to like introduce to people I care about. Exactly. I'm I'm very much on the same page. I actually, I know that Mike didn't have time to watch this film this week, mm. but what I said to him was, is this is a film that I really want you to listen to the first episode mm. and then go check this out. And yeah. I, I cannot recommend this film enough because I really had a lot of fun with it. I was so pleasantly shocked. Yes, yeah, so was I. So was I. I knew it would be good, but I, I didn't know like which direction. How, how is it going to be this good? And it was more than I was expecting. I think that's it then for our discussion. I guess upcoming, we've got April. We're getting into April already here uh, by the time these two episodes air. I think the plan is to do an animation next, which is always exciting because there are so many animated films that especially like some of the japanese films and i'm kind of leaning towards maybe studio ghibli yes studio ghibli yeah i really want to do a studio ghibli i think this time yeah i've only seen two of them and um they're very strange and enjoyable they draw you in they're essentially like japanese disney movies but with like the quirkiness of japanese culture kind of from a from a Western audience perspective, kind of yeah, thing, right? Yeah, like it's it's not um, mainstream, like just mass appeal kind of, and like getting you like just happy go lucky feels throughout the whole thing, and like sad moments. Yeah, like and, it's and, it's and less formulaic too. Yeah, 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 less Disney princess formulaic kind of. Yeah, thing. yeah, exactly. So I, that's kind of where I'm leaning towards. If you have a favorite of the Studio Ghibli films, let us know because we haven't settled on this. This is just kind of something that I'm even springing on you now is kind of mm. where my thought process was going. But I think you and Mike both are excited and intrigued by the Studio Ghibli filmography that I think it's worth checking out. Yeah, I'd love to see some other ones uh, that I haven't seen. But otherwise, yeah, that's kind of on the horizon. So look forward to that and let us know in the comments if uh, there's a film in particular that, that you're interested in. Any new film can shock us just like this one. So we're always down for any recommendation, really. Yeah, absolutely. Very much agree. Because like I said, this film has a 7.0 rating on IMDb, and I think that's a crime. Yeah, I agree. I guess that's it then for the episode. Uh, we'll see you next time. And we're signing off. <laughs> we we have to come up with a real thing that we say at the end <laughs> especially that in between ups like when we stop the first time even a good podcaster can hurt this oh, yeah yeah that's a good one <laughs> yeah all right well anyway have a good one everyone all right thanks